The Lord be with you. We welcome you to worship on this 13th weekend after Pentecost. As we gather this evening, may God's word continue to inform our faith and our, and our lives. We ask everyone to fill out the cards there in your pews, and after the service, you can leave them in the offering plates at the entrances to the church. Before we do anything else, let's take a moment to greet the folks around you. Just one announcement this evening, our annual voters meeting will take place next Sunday, August 29th at 9.30 a.m. during the Bible class. Uh, election of officers, presentation of the budget, and a discussion regarding staffing will be on the agenda for that meeting. So we hope you'll join us and take part of the decision making of our congregation. Our order of service this evening is divine service setting four, printed in your bulletin or beginning on page 203 in our hymnals. We now begin with our opening hymn, hymn 795. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who, who made, made heaven, heaven and earth. earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, 
and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our intro it from Psalm 26. O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the, and the place, place where your glory dwells. Vindicate me, O oh Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O oh Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O oh Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house, and the place where your glory dwells. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, defend your church from all false teaching and error, that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God and rejoice in your good gifts of life and salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Our Old Testament reading comes from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 29. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder. And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay, that the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Is it not yet a very little while until Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be regarded as a forest? In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. And we rise to sing our response. The Holy Gospel, which also serves as the basis for the sermon, is written in the seventh chapter of Mark, beginning at the first verse. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. When the Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, 
Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. We confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The hymn of the day is hymn 585, and you may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. In the Pew Bible, this is found on page 1001, and I'll read again verse 5 to start. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have called us out of the darkness of sin and unbelief and death, into the marvelous light of your Son, who is our life and salvation. We pray, dear Lord, that even as we live out our lives and in the many traditions and customs that we have, that those may always be used to elevate your word and make Jesus shine before our eyes and our hearts, rather than hide him. Preserve us, O Lord, and protect us by your word and spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in the 1950s, there was this cheesy science fiction movie, well, most science fiction movies in the 50s were pretty cheesy, called When Worlds Collide. And the upshot of the movie was a rogue star and the planet that circled it had gotten somehow loose and was headed toward the Earth, and there was only a few months to get a rocket ship arc to uh, take some people and some animals off the planet before it was destroyed. And the long and the short of it is that rogue star uh, did hit the earth and the earth didn't make out too well afterward. Worlds collided, but the rocket ship made it to the planet Zyrus or whatever it was and a new paradise was found. All right, so that's what happens, I guess, when worlds collide. But what happens when words collide? And I'm talking about the word of God versus the word of men. There again, a similar disaster can take place. Uh, not that God's word will be destroyed, for the word of the Lord endures forever, the scriptures tell us. And that uh, heaven and earth may pass away, but my word will never pass away, the Lord says. So always, man's word is going to finally end up being on the losing end and in a disastrous state. Here in chapter 7, we see words colliding uh, here as the Pharisees are bracing Jesus about his disciples not following the tradition of the elders. We pick up at verse 1 of chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. All right, this is part of the fact-finding commission that the Pharisees had. They've been bugging Jesus all along since back in chapter 3. They aren't there seeking information so that their, their, their souls can grow and so that their sins can be forgiven as they put their trust in Jesus as the promised one of the scriptures. No, they're on a fault-finding mission, not a fact-finding mission. They're looking for any excuse to try to undermine Jesus before the people and to show him as a fraud. And understand, the Pharisees and the scribes were very much looked up to by, by the people of Israel, by the Jews. The, the Pharisees were considered the premier um, pious people who really kept a rigorous outward keeping of the laws and the traditions. And so they were like the superheroes, or the super Jew, if you will. And, uh, and so here... They, they are bringing the criticism in verse 2 that some of Jesus' disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And again, you and I and most Gentiles, we wouldn't have a clue. I mean, we would think, oh, that's like our mom when we're kids coming in for, for dinner time and mom says, show me your hands. Did you wash your hands? Young man, get back into that bathroom and let me see that your fingernails are clean. This is not what's being talked about here. This is purely in terms of religion and ceremony and tradition. That one would have to go through this ritual cleansing in order to make oneself right before God before eating their food. And Mark goes on to explain that the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, and the Greek word there is baptize, interestingly enough, holding to the tradition of the elders. See, so this is not something that had been commanded by God in the laws of Moses. These were traditions that developed perhaps for very good reasons. 
but became perverted to where they were almost elevated to or surpasses the Word of God. So that I would judge you not based on whether you have broken a commandment of God, but I would judge your purity or your holiness or your worthiness based on your adherence to a tradition of the elders that was handed down. And so Mark explains when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and there are many other traditions they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper, uh, copper vessels and dining couches. So this was an elaborate uh, kind of a thing that the Pharisees had developed over, say, 500 years or so. And it was becoming this burden that was placed upon people, almost where you would have people watching to see if you conformed, watching to see if you kept as good as I do the traditions. And apparently some of the disciples neglected that tradition. And so it falls to Jesus that in the Pharisees' mind, Jesus, you're deficient because you didn't teach your disciples correctly, that you didn't teach them to observe these traditions. Now we know from the scriptures that Jesus and his disciples kept the laws of God as given through Moses. He kept them all. He kept them perfectly. They didn't, the disciples. Even the Pharisees couldn't. And that's perhaps why they were relying on the traditions to make up for. Hey, maybe I did a lousy job with the commandments, Lord, but look how I kept the traditions. That's got to count for something, right? Oh, man, when words collide. And so the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with unclean or defiled hands? Why didn't they do the ritual? Why didn't they do that thing? And, you know, for the people that have the idea that, you know, of the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and butter wouldn't melt in his mouth, um, here he drills them right between the eyes. And it's not because he does not love them. It is because he does. He has come to die for the sins of the world, including theirs, but the hardness of their heart and their spiritual blindness will keep them away from it unless something is done. Uh, and so Jesus, he does hit them hard here by saying, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. Now, this is not a condemnation of tradition. This is not a condemnation of formality. This is a condemnation of formalism that thinks that somehow my righteousness is in what I am doing and how I am following these traditions. When, and the traditions themselves were hiding the word of God. We're hiding the grace of God. And that was the problem. Not that there were traditions, not that there was structure or formality, but that it was all being used as a self-justifying measure. And that's why they're honoring him with their lips, even while, while their heart is far away from, from God. Um, the quote that I found in one of the commentaries says this, the hypocrite tries to appear before men as he ought to be before God, and yet is not. We ought to appear before God as holy, and yet too often we fall short of the glory of God, as St. Paul writes. And so we try to appear before men as if we are so. That's hypocrisy. And there are those outside of the church, and there are even some who are maybe got their noses out of joint regarding the church, who will say, well, I won't go to that congregation because they're all hypocrites there. And I've joked with some of you, I've always wished I had the backbone to say, well, why don't you come join us? There's always room for one more. Because let's face it, if you're looking for the perfect congregation with the perfect people, the moment you join it, it'll cease to be perfect. Because this is a place of sinners. This is a place for sinners. Not that we can glory in our sin, not that we can justify our sin and learn new ways of sinning, 
but that we who are broken and damaged, walking, wounded, can find help and healing through Christ, who is the Savior of sinners, so that we can see in his blood-bought redemption that rather than final judgment and condemnation because of our sins, there is instead welcome and acceptance by God because our sins have been forgiven in Christ. But you see, if we hide the word of God and hide the fact that we are justified not by our works but by faith alone in Jesus Christ, if we begin to judge one another by the purity of our tradition keeping rather than our fidelity to the word of the gospel, well then we're damaging ourselves and hiding Jesus from us. And so this is why Jesus says, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, God's word had taken a back seat. Man's word had become forward. And again, it was a terrible burden. And this is not just a problem of the Pharisees. You see it in every generation and among every people, and I dare say the temptation can be found in every denomination of Christianity, and certainly you'll find it outside of Christianity, where a tradition becomes so important that we rather would cling to that than change it if we need to so that the gospel may shine forth purely. Um, the old saw, we never did it that way before, can be a death knell. And, and again, please understand, I love tradition, and I love formality, I love structure, I love liturgy, and I think we have it right. But we dare not use what we have to judge others who do not follow the same kind of a format as long as they have Jesus Christ crucified and raised as their proclamation. We are all then brothers and sisters in Christ, all members of one another in the body of Christ, and we have the opportunity to share why what we have is such a good thing as it points to Jesus and upholds his word, and perhaps they can do the same for us. But they leave behind, the Pharisees did, the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And Jesus then gives an example of how they undermine the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, by telling somebody, hey, if you do donate your if you dedicate, you vow your money to, to God, well, then you don't have to support your parents. And you can keep your money as long as you do, as long as eventually you give it over. And so the fourth commandment gets put behind to support a tradition. Do we get caught up into this? Sure. You can see it civilly in, in the culture um, without getting too far into the weeds. Take the issue of masks. Not that you should or shouldn't wear them, but the judgmentalism on both sides concerning whether somebody is wearing a mask or not. Has that become a tradition where we begin to judge the goodness of a person by whether or not he or she wears a mask? Well, you're not wearing a mask. You must want to murder people. Or, you're wearing a mask. You must be scared and can't really understand science. You know, I mean, come on. Are we really going to be at each other's throats instead of giving charity and love and compassion to each other to say, well, you probably thought this through and for you this is the best thing to wear the mask or you probably thought this through and for you it's the best thing not to. You know, there's some personal responsibility there. We see it amongst churches where those of a maybe a more formal liturgical um, structure will want to judge those with less of one as somehow being less Christian. Or those, and I've really seen this happen, those who follow a less structured thing will look at a more structured liturgy and say, oh, you're just following the teachings of men, whereas we follow the teachings of God. And come on, baloney. Where is Jesus in all of this? That's really what it boils down to. Where is the Word of God? You know, people, we need structure, we need form, we need things that we can connect to regularly. The liturgy helps us to do that, but if it's not based on the Word of God, then you better jettison it and find something that is. Thank God ours is. 
because it's not something we cooked up. It's something that's been handed down and developed by Christians throughout the church in, through the ages because the liturgy points to Jesus Christ crucified and raised for you. And so here in this whole thing, we've got to constantly be careful because a judgmentalism is right there below the, thir- the surface for each one of us. Each of us is a little Pharisee at heart. We really are wanting to judge somebody else by our standards, not necessarily God's word. And we need to repent of that and to thank God that he does not judge us as we judge one another. But instead, he judges us through his son who bore the judgment and our sins so that we might be forgiven and receive mercy. May God grant that we show mercy and forgiveness to our neighbor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep each of your hearts and minds in true faith to life eternal. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament. In our prayers before the service of the sacrament, we pray for Mike Southworth, who is hospitalized and recovering from recent surgery, for Karen Andreski, who is home after recent surgery, for Don Van Cura in hospice. We pray for strength and healing for Aaron Shu, Nelson Young, and Susie Phillips. And at the conclusion of our prayers, we continue then with the service of the sacrament. Let us rise for prayer. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the legacies that have been handed down to us by the faithful throughout the years. That indeed, O oh Lord, there is form and substance in our worship, uh, and that as, that as that glorifies Jesus and upholds your word, this is a good and wholesome thing. But preserve us, O oh Lord, from elevating those human-made things to a status equal to or greater than your word, to where we would deny your word in favor of the things that that are invented by the human heart. O Lord, in all those things we pray for your holy church on earth, that she would be purified, that whether in formal or less formal types of worship, that Christ would continue to be glorified as the one who is the redeemer of the world and the savior of sinners and the one who has conquered death in the grave for us. Lord, let us judge not according to our fallen hearts, but according to your word, so that in these judgments we may uphold those things that are true and good and wholesome, and also that we might bring those along with us to know this as well. Dear Father, be with Mike and Karen as they are recovering from their surgeries. Bless them, O Lord, and help them in their time of need. Be with Don as he continues in hospice care, that the health care workers would continue to to take care of him. And, and provide for his needs and give strength to his family as well. We pray that you would be with Aaron, Nelson, and Susie in their illnesses, that you would strengthen and heal them according to your will and be with their families and give them strength in these difficult times. Dear Heavenly Father, the world has become even a crazier place lately with natural disasters such as fires and floods and earthquakes Be with those who are affected by these things and bring help and healing in the midst of of the destruction. Bring us all to repentance too, that we are reminded that this world is passing away. We also pray for the situation in Afghanistan. Oh Lord, help the people that are trying to to find uh, release and rescue. We pray that you would defend your Christians over there from the Uh, from the evil of the Taliban that are seeking to kill and to destroy them. We pray that that our people can be gotten out of there and those that have helped us gotten out safely. We pray for our troops that you would defend and protect them against injury and death. And we pray that whatever the, the causes for how things have become now, that you would grant wisdom to our political and military leaders, that they may see ways of taking this very bad situation and bringing about something good from it. Oh Lord, we pray your mercy and we pray your strength and guidance
presence through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift, we lift them to the, to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to give him thanks and praise. praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemn the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
preserve you in body and in soul unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
Our liturgy continues with the singing of the Nunc Dimittis, and we rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on that day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.